Good morning. Good morning. You know, I, I do always love it when, um, when a hymn can help clarify something in Scripture that's not as clear, you know? It said, uh, verse 2 there, um, uh, Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. See, Alabama, Jesus was an Alabama fan. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, if you ever wondered why I was an Alabama fan, it's just because Jesus is, you know. And okay, I will, I will repent now, and we'll get to actual truth of God's word. That's also why it's not in God's word; it's in a hymn. Okay. Anyway, so this morning we are going to continue in our series in First Corinthians. We're going to be looking at First Corinthians chapter fifteen, and we're going to start with just the first eleven verses. So I'm going to read God's word, we will pray, and we'll see what God has for us today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you that your word is life and truth. Lord, I thank you that through your word we can have a deeper, fuller, richer understanding of who you are. We can have a richer, fuller, deeper understanding of your great love for us. Lord, I pray this morning as we continue in our worship through the study of your word, Lord, I pray that your word would be prominent in this place this morning. Lord, I pray that you would set me to the side and that your word would be what we encounter in this place this morning. Lord, I pray again that you would remove the distractions that would seek to hinder us from hearing your word today. And Lord, I pray that if we find ourselves not in line with your word, that today would be a day that we repent, that we surrender once again to the lordship of Jesus Christ, to your lordship in our lives. Have your way in this place today. Be glorified. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ, his life, death, burial, and resurrection are foundational to our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. We do not worship a God that was made by human hands. We do not worship a God that is contrived by the desires of our hearts or to fulfill our wishes and whims. We do not serve a God who is dead and gone, but we serve a God who has existed from eternity past. A God who is maker, sustainer, savior, and Lord. We serve a God who stepped into his creation to provide the ultimate sacrifice, the payment for our sins. We serve a God who defeated sin and death. We serve a God who died in our place, but a God who did not stay dead. A God who rose from the grave. We serve a God who completed the work of salvation and now sits at the right hand of the Father. We serve a God who paid the price for our salvations. That as Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
Paul has gone through a number of different things thus far with the church at Corinth. He's been addressing the disunity. He's been addressing the misunderstanding. He's been addressing the bad theology. He's been addressing the sin that has not been called out. We just looked at where he talks about spiritual gifts and why we have them and what we're supposed to use them for. And in chapter 15, he turns to proclaiming again the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the foundation of the church both at Corinth and the church today. He's reminding them of the primary reason in which they have gathered together. And he begins with, Now I would remind you, brothers, the gospel of Jesus Christ is central to our faith and lives. And in this chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul is reminding the believers at Corinth of the gospel, of the centrality of the gospel in their faith. But why would they need to be reminded of the gospel? He's talking to the church. He's talking to those who have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Why would he need to remind them? In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Paul tells the Corinthians, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do, not, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. We should regularly examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. This isn't about doubting our salvation, but regularly evaluating where we stand in our Christian walk. One time that we should regularly have that we should regularly make of examining ourselves is when we approach the Lord's, su the Lord's Supper. We should examine our hearts to see if there's any unrepentant sin, to see if there's anything we need to deal with before we partake of the elements of communion. We as a church have a tradition of uh, taking the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of each month. It's a regular time scheduled within our worship services in which we come to the table. We should regularly evaluate our lives. We should examine ourselves to see if there's anything in us that needs to be repented of, that needs to be dealt with. And Paul puts it in there that there should be, there should be regular times in which we examine ourselves, that we check ourselves. And, and again, it's not about doubting our faith. It's not about doubting our salvation, but it's checking ourselves. It's that evaluation to say, how, how's my life doing? I, I don't know about you, but through the, through the years of, of salvation, I was, I was saved when I was around 11, 12 years old, made a profession of faith. I remember it very clearly, and I have no doubt of that salvation, but through my time as a Christian, there have been some seasons where I haven't walked with God very closely, and I've needed to examine myself. And there's been times of repentance. There's been times of turning back to be on that right path. And for each one of us, we should examine ourselves. And as you examine yourself, if you really look at your life and you begin to say, you know, I don't, I don't know that I see any evidence of salvation in my life, that's a good point to say, hey, I need to be saved. Because the last thing in the world we, wanted, we would want to do is fool ourselves into thinking that we are saved when we've never truly surrendered. We've never received the salvation. But so Paul says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you. What is the gospel? The Greek word that is translated gospel in its simplest form means good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news of Jesus' plan for our salvation. That is the good news, is that Jesus Christ died on a cross and paid the price so that we could be saved. That is good news. It's the good news about Jesus. I've already quoted uh, uh, Romans uh, 10, verse 9, where it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, uh, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you go down to verse 13, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Man, that's good news. But listen to what it says next. It says, How then will they call on him and who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. The gospel must be proclaimed. Paul preached or proclaimed the gospel to the Corinthians, and many believed and were saved. Paul had a specific calling for proclaiming the gospel, which we're going to look at a little bit later, but each of us also has a calling to proclaim the gospel in the sphere of influence in which God has given us. Each one of us is a proclaimer of the gospel. 
And I, and I really think, I mean, the translation is correct in which in verse 15 of chapter 10 of Romans it says, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? But the problem is, is that we hear that and we go, well, not everybody's called to be a preacher. That's true. Not everybody's called to be a preacher. But the, but the message behind what he's saying there is how are they to believe unless, how's the gospel to be heard unless it is proclaimed? It's not about preaching like I'm doing now. It's about proclaiming the gospel, the good news. If you've received the good news, you need to proclaim the good news to the world around you. When we found something good, we should tell somebody about it. When we found something good, we should tell somebody about it. You know, I, uh, I have a confession this morning. I'm Joe Lemons, and I like food. Like probably one of my biggest struggles in life is just I like to eat. Anybody, anybody identify with me in that, you know? And, you know, I like it when, when people can, can tell me good places to go eat and I can find something new. Now, I did uh, both, both my, my master, a master's degree and my doctorate uh, through New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Now, I did that extension. I actually lived in Bradenton for most of the time that I worked on my master's, finished it up when we lived in Brooksville, and then did my doctorate while I was living in Winter Haven. So I did it all distance, but I had to make trips to New Orleans many, many times. Now, listen, there's a lot of sin in New Orleans, okay? Just, let's just be clear on that. But there's also a lot of good places to eat in New Orleans. As a matter of fact, that was my favorite reason to go to New Orleans was that I could get something good to eat there that I would enjoy. And what's interesting is that every time I went to New Orleans, just about every time that I went to it, one time I went, one time I went and I, and I had a, a, a bout of diverticulitis and I, and I couldn't eat anything good. It was the worst trip to New Orleans I ever made. Not even because I felt bad, it's just because I couldn't eat good, you know? Y'all understand the problem I have in life, you know? And uh, anyways, um, uh, what amazed me is that, that with as many times, and I can't even count the number of times that I've been to New Orleans, it seems like every time I go, either someone I'm talking to new who I'm telling them I'm going to New Orleans or someone that I meet there tells me about a new place that I need to try when I'm there. There's just so many places to eat. And they've changed even through the years. You know, some of those storms that went through changed some of that. But there's a lot of different good places. But, but man, when, when I find something good, if, if you tell me you're going to New Orleans, I'm going to testify to you about some good places to eat. I'm going to share the good news of good restaurants in New Orleans with you so that you too can partake and enjoy the food of New Orleans. How much more? Should we who have received the salvation that Jesus Christ bought and paid for on that cross share that good news with the world around us? We have found something good. Not, not just good. We have found something that is life-giving. And we should share that with others. Just as we share a good restaurant or some new food that we found that we enjoy, how much more should we share the good news of our salvation with other people? Paul says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received. It is not simply enough for us to hear the gospel. In the book of James, we are told to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. James goes on to say, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. We must receive this salvation. It, it's kind of like, you know, have you, ever, have you ever had somebody come to you for advice about something? Like they've come to, to seek your advice. Maybe it's about how to fix something at their house or how to deal with a certain circumstance or situation. And so you give them good news, right? You give them good advice. And then they go and they don't do what, what you, you told them to do. Have you ever had that happen, anybody? You ever had kids? I mean, you know. And you tell them the good news about how to solve their problem or how to fix or whatever, and they don't go and do it. And then they come back and they complain. And you're like, well, you didn't do what I told you to do. You heard me, but you didn't receive it. It didn't change your life. It didn't affect how you go and do what you're going to do. Listen, we can hear the gospel all day long. There's lots of people through the centuries since Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection who have heard the message, but they didn't receive the message. Ephesians tells us, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
We don't earn our salvation. We don't, uh, we, we don't uh, 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 do enough good works. You know, we, we get messed up in our world today in this justice system, if you can call it that anymore, um, in which, you know, and sometimes we, we, we can get confused into thinking, well, you know, as long as the good things outweigh the bad things, I'm okay. That's not what the Bible says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, if you want to be real specific about what it says in God's word, there are no good things that we do. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's no amount of works. There's no amount of good deeds. There's no amount of good enough stuff. We can't give enough money. You know, in this world, we think that money makes the world go round. And if we just had enough money, right? Have you ever, have you ever seen, like, you're driving down the road and you see the, the billboards for the lottery, you know? I, I like having imagination, you know, and I, I'll be driving and I'll see, you know, that the, the lottery's up to $150 million. You know what I could do with $150 million? Well, nothing because you don't get $150 million even if you win it, right? You take that lump sum, which is the right thing to do, and tithe off that. And you get $75 million, you know, and then the government's going to take half of that. If you give some to the church, you pay less to the government. I mean, that's just how that works. And I think, man, you know, and my mind goes with that. I'm like, man, I take the lump sum, 75 million, you know, I'll pay my tax and, and I'll tithe it, and man, then I can do this and this, this, and I won't have any problems in the world. Right? Now we can confuse ourselves into thinking. You know, just as a side note, you know, have you ever thought, God, if you just let me win the lottery, I'll give I'll give enough money to the church that we can accomplish whatever needs to be accomplished. Let me ask you this question. You ever prayed that somebody else in the church would get the money and they would accomplish that? We we'll only ever pray it for ourselves to get it, don't we? I do. I mean, confession here. But the truth is, we can't do enough. We can't pay for our salvation. It's a work of God. We've got to receive. As Paul says, he says, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. As I was studying this, my mind went to this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. It, man, listen to this one. When darkness veils His lovely face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, His covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. The only thing that we have to stand on in this world is Jesus Christ. When we try to stand on our own abilities, when we try to stand on our own merit, we fall short. Jesus Christ is the rock. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Salvation is so much bigger than a one-time event. Throughout the New Testament, we read about salvation in past, present, and future tense. I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. At the moment we first receive the gospel, we are saved. We are justified and made in right standing with God. From that moment on, from the moment that we have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead, that you will be saved. From that point... We are in right standing with God, but from that point on, God begins to work in us to mold us and shape us into the image of His Son. Thus, we are being saved. This is called sanctification. And when we breathe our last on this earth, we are then in the presence of the Lord. We are glorified. We will be saved. I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. 
Salvation is a process that works itself out in the believer's life from the moment that we are first justified until the mo moment that we are glorified. That all is a work of salvation. And so, so when he says, by which you are being saved, it's not, and we can get confused, right? Especially in our world of, of, of like when you're trying to load something on your old slow computer, you know? And, and it's loading and loading and loading, you know, and it's like 80%, 90%, you know, and you're, and you're just waiting with great anticipation and it gets to 99% and your battery dies. <laughs> and you got to start all over again. See, and sometimes we can get confused into thinking that's how salvation works. Like we're, we're striving and striving and striving for the salvation, and then the power went out, and we've got to start all over again. No. From the moment that we, uh, that we receive that salvation, that we confess Jesus Christ, Lord, we are saved. But then through that, God works in us to mold us and shape us. His Holy Spirit lives inside of us to mold us and shape us into the image of His Son. And I've got seasons of life where, man, that has looked really, really good. And I've got way too many seasons in life where I feel like I'm just beat up constantly because I just can't seem to get it together. But all of it is a work of the Holy Spirit in me that's molding me and shaping me, that's correcting those mistakes. So he says, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. When we look at the full counsel of the Word of God, I don't believe that someone can lose their salvation. And this is why it's important that we look at the full counsel of the Word of God and not just take one verse and take it out of context and believe something that's inaccurate according to the full counsel of the Word of God. For example, if you go to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Meaning that when we have received Jesus Christ, there is now no condemnation for us. And here's the thing, I couldn't do anything to earn my salvation to begin with, so I can't do anything to hold on to that salvation. God has saved me. While I do not believe that someone can lose their salvation, I think that there could be many who were never saved to begin with, but think that they are. You remember the parable of the sower we read about in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke? In that parable, Jesus talks about four different responses to the gospel. One response is total rejection, and one response is true salvation. The other two responses are those who think they are saved, but are not. Remember, if you, maybe you're not familiar with the parable. It talks about the sower who goes and spreads the seed. Some falls on good soil. I'm not doing this in order. This is the Joe Lemons translation. You go and read the, the correct one, okay? Some of it falls on good soil, and it springs up and produces fruit. Different folds. Some of it falls on the, on the rocky path and the birds come and sweep it and, and, no, and they, never, they just reject the gospel together. But the other two both have something that sprouts up but then something that sweeps it away. The trials of the world, the, the work of the devil. What's crazy about that is of those four responses, one is just total rejection and one is salvation. The other two are people who respond and think that they are saved but they've never truly had their roots in Jesus Christ. And if you think I'm, I'm too far off, if you're thinking I'm taking the parable beyond what Jesus meant, I want to tell you about the two scariest passages in all of the Bible, in my opinion. They're both found in Matthew. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about separating the sheep from the goats. So he puts the sheep on his one side and the goats on the other. And he says to one, Well done, my good and faithful servants. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I, when I was in need, you cared for me. Enter into your reward. And to the, other, he, the others, he says, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was in need and you didn't provide. Depart from me. And they say, when did we do that? And he says, that which you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. I think he was, Jesus was expounding there on what he said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, now did you hear, listen, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? This isn't talking about people who are outside the church. This isn't talking about people who don't know God. This is people who say, did we not say, did we not, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, 
I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That passage and those two coupled should make each and every one of us shudder just a little bit. Because it's the reality that there's a lot of people who will hear the message and even think that they are saved, but they've never truly received the gospel. They've never surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And the problem in our culture today, I'm talking about the culture in the United States of America, we have a very easy believism. We have a lot of churches out there that claim to preach the gospel, but they deny the power of the gospel. They like the idea of Jesus Christ as Savior, but they reject the idea of Jesus Christ as Lord. Because they want to still be the boss of their life. They want to be the one who still says what is right and wrong. But salvation is a dying to self. That's what baptism represents. It's the going under the water represents us dying to ourself, to our sinfulness, to the way of life that leads to destruction, and it's coming up out of the water as the symbolism of being made new in Jesus Christ. It's a symbol of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, which we experience when we die to self, and Jesus makes us alive through the Spirit of God that takes up residence within us. Let us always be mindful that we can only be sure of our own salvation and no one else's. And so we should never miss the opportunity to present the gospel, to share the good news. As a matter of fact, I heard someone say that when we encounter new people, we should just assume they're lost until we know otherwise. Right? And, and see, the problem is people go, oh, you assume they're lost, that's mean. Well, how does the Bible tell us to treat lost people? To love them, to care for them, to find ways in which we can, can share the gospel with them? Sometimes that's meeting a very real physical need and so that it opens the door to meet a spiritual need. I don't think that sounds very horrible for how we would treat people. If somebody treated me like that because they assumed I was lost, I might pretend to be lost longer so they keep doing good stuff. I'm just joking. <laughs> Paul goes on and he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Now he's about to lay out what the gospel is. But before we get to that, listen to what he says. He says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. Paul delivered to the, Corinthian, to the Corinthians the gospel, which he's about to lay out. But he says it is of first importance. As believers and as a church, there are many things that we could spend time and energy focused on. But there is only one thing that is of first importance, and that is the gospel. There are many things that we, can, that we can go and do. Events, mercy ministries, fellowship. But everything must come second to delivering the gospel. Mercy ministries are one of the things that, 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 can, get, that can get us confused into what our purpose and our point are. Because when we do things like mercy ministry, when we're meeting real needs for people, one, it's very tangible, right? Like, like some, somebody needs help with something. Like a, we find a family that, that's down on their luck and their yard's overgrown and we go out with mowers and trimmers and we trim it up and make it all look good. Man, we can see the work that we did. We can see the response from the people as they are grateful for what has taken place. So that's a mercy ministry. And it's not that that is a bad thing. But if we stop there, we've totally missed the point for why we've been called. Because I would argue that as believers, whenever we do these mercy ministries, it should be so that it opens a door to meet a very real need, which is a spiritual need. I've done a lot of mission trips in my time uh, working in church. I did youth ministry uh, um, the entire time I was in ministry up until I went to Lake Ship as lead pastor. Still worked a lot with the youth there. Got to do a lot of mission trips with a lot of youth groups. And let me tell you, a lot of those mission trips were revolved around mercy ministry and no spiritual ministry, no gospel ministry. I've re-roofed some houses in Florida in the heat. That's just like punishment. But let me tell you something. Those roofs have to be re-roofed again. Even if you use those 30-year shingles, they only last like 15 years. You know that? You can mow somebody's yard and guess what? If it rains right and all that, you're going to need to mow it again in a week. And believe me, it's not that doing any of that is wrong. It's not that meeting those needs are wrong. But if we stop there... We've given them nothing of spiritual value, of eternal value. 
Now, that doesn't mean that every time we do a mercy ministry, we need to see that somebody comes to a saving faith in Jesus. Sometimes we're just planting the seeds. You know, Paul, Paul talks about how that, that some, some plant and some water and, and, and some, some encouragement, but it's God that gives the growth. We don't always know what, what the things that we do, what the ultimate outcome is. But let's never miss an opportunity, and let's, let's make sure that the things we do as a church have the ultimate focus of sharing the gospel, seeing people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so as a church, as we, as we gather together and, and under the banner of to know God and to make Him known across the street and to the ends of the earth, as, as we as a church gather around this, this idea of that we're going to accomplish this knowing God and making Him known by gathering and growing and going, gathering together as the church in group times like we do now and as well as in our fellowship times, growing in our faith as we study God's Word and we make that a part of our regular life as well as being part of one of our growth groups that takes place right before this, and then going. Every time you walk out that door, you are going across the street into the ends of the earth. You take the gospel with you as you go. And as a church, we're going to provide opportunities that we go as a church. But in all of that, we need to filter everything through the gospel lens that are we taking the gospel and making much of who Jesus is. Not just meeting a physical need to meet a physical need, but if we're meeting a physical need, it's so that we can have an opportunity to share about a much greater need, which is a spiritual Because if we meet somebody's physical need but neglect the opportunity to share about their physical need, we have greatly limited the opportunity, that we've greatly limited the benefit that we can have to them. Because meeting that spiritual need is a benefit that will last for all eternity. Jesus made the command very clear. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He didn't say go and make converts. He didn't even say go and, and, and make church members. He said go and make disciples. Baptizing them and teaching them. So what are we supposed to go with? We're supposed to go with the gospel. And what is the gospel? Well, I'm glad you asked because Paul lays it out right here. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. After Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sin entered the world, God provided a temporary covering for sin, the animal sacrifices. We read in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, as, as God is giving his, the, the Jewish people, Abraham's descendants, his followers, commands about how they're supposed to live. He's, he's talking about they're not supposed to eat things that still have the blood in it. He says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. After Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to cover their nakedness. They recognized that there was a problem there. And they tried to cover themselves with leaves. They sewed fig leaves together. But that was never a covering for sin. There had to be a sacrifice. Because as we read in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And the first animal sacrifice was made by God himself as he killed the animal and took the skin of the animal to make clothes for Adam and Eve. And with that, he established the sacrificial system in which animals were sacrificed to atone, to pacify God's wrath against the sin of man. But those animal sacrifices were never the satisfaction for God's wrath against sin. The law was, was never perfect to make us holy. Jesus Christ came to be the perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, when He died on that cross, He was the perfect sacrifice that would no longer pacify God's wrath against sin, but it would satisfy God's wrath against sin. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Jesus didn't stay dead. If Jesus stayed in that tomb, He would be no different than any other man. He would be no different than any other religious leader. But Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. Jesus rose from the dead. He defeated sin and death once for all. And that, He appeared. The resurrection of Jesus is one of the most documented events in history, and yet people questioned its authenticity. 
Of the five major religions of the world, Christianity is the only one that claims its founder is still alive. Abraham, the founder of the Jewish faith, is still in the grave. No disciple of Buddha has claimed to have ever spoken or seen Buddha after his death. And Muhammad, the founder of Islam, is still in the grave, and tens of thousands of devout Muslims still travel to his grave each year. But Jesus Christ didn't stay in that tomb. He rose from the dead. And he didn't rise from the dead in secret. He didn't do it so that there would be questions. It says, Paul gives the, the evidence right here. He says he appeared first to Cephas, that is Peter. Then he appeared to the full 12 disciples. Now this would have been, um, uh, you know, Judas had already hung himself after he betrayed Jesus and they appointed another one. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom at the time of, of Paul writing this are alive, though some have died. So he appears to over 500 people at one time. Then he appeared to James. Now, we don't know for sure if this was James the, the disciple or James the brother of John. I believe it was James the brother of John because he's already talked about the fact that he appeared um, to, to, the, to the other disciples. I think that this was his half-brother who didn't believe in Jesus while he was on this earth but then became a leader in the church after that. My, my brother would have to raise from the dead for me to believe he was something. And I love my brother. Could, could you just imagine what it was like growing up as... Jesus' brother, you know, like, takes on a whole new meaning. Why can't you be more like your brother? <laughs> <laughs> then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. All the apostles. That's what qualified these men to be apostles. We talked about this over the last couple of weeks. The apostolic age has ended. There's not new apostles today. God had appointed the apostles for that time to bring the word of God together, and now we have it. And then Paul says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul says that he's the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because he persecuted the church. Paul set out to eradicate this thing known as the way. He believed that it was a corruption of the Jewish faith. He got letters from the Sanhedrin so that he could go out and he could rip out these people who were followers of Jesus Christ and have them stoned to death. He stood there as Stephen was stoned to death, holding, watching over the garments of those who were stoning Stephen. And then on the way to Damascus, this young, fiery man named Saul who was out to abolish Christianity encountered the risen Jesus Christ. And it changed his life. I'm going to tell you something. Paul never got over his salvation. Paul never got over the realization that he was a sinner who deserved hell except but Jesus Christ imparted grace to him. I would say that we all need to make sure that we never get over our salvation. I think that we should all make sure that we never get over the fact that we were sinners who deserved hell but by the grace of God. I love that verse. But by the grace of God, Paul says, I am what I am and his grace towards me was not in vain Bill shared with us earlier grace is receiving something that we don't deserve none of us deserved salvation none of us deserved to be forgiven none of us were good enough none of us were pretty enough none of us were wealthy enough none of us tried hard enough none of us deserved salvation we all deserved hell as a matter of fact after God created the world and made it perfect and gave Adam and Eve and, and they had the garden they had, it was all good. And they messed it up. And God could have said, you know what? I gave you a chance. You're, you're going to go to hell. And, and God still would have been just as holy and just and righteous if he had done that. But God in his grace didn't end there but gave us Jesus Christ. And like Paul, I can say by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul says that that while he was the least of all apostles, he worked harder. And, and Paul's quick to say, he's not claiming and boasting that he did something great. He says it's the spirit that works in him. But man, is there not evidence of that as we look at who wrote most of the New Testament? This man who set out to eradicate the church and God transformed his life miraculously, incredibly. But then Paul goes on to say, and you know what? Whether it was me or someone else, the gospel was preached and you received it. And he rejoices because Paul isn't about growing Paul's kingdom. He's about growing God's kingdom. And that's our purpose as we gather together as Calvary Baptist Church. I'm so glad that God has called me and my family here, and I'm excited about what God has for the future. But make no mistake about it, I'm not here.
to grow Calvary Baptist Church. I'm here to grow the kingdom of God. The church will grow from that if we're just faithful to go and to share the good news across the street and to the ends of the earth. We have an incredible opportunity. Do you know how many people were on our property Friday night? Any idea how many people were on our property Friday night? There was a football game. It's kind of noisy if, you, if you've never been around for one. We were getting ready for bed and Letty goes, our, our little one, you know, she's four. She goes, did, did you hear that? She could hear the, the noise. She goes, what are they doing still playing a game? It's bedtime. She knows better than to be out late at night playing some game. But they're all over our property. They park everywhere. Let's make sure we take those opportunities. I think we need to get a sign made up. This is just one star. This is minimal, minimal, minimal. Let's get a sign made up that says, we're so glad you parked here. We hope you'll come back again. And then some information about our church. Let's put it on every window when they park there. I don't think we end there. I think we start there. All right, that's where we start. All right, so, so we need to get a flyer made up. And I need volunteers who say, you know, I don't like talking to people, but I'll put a flyer on somebody's car. And it'll be your job every home game to come put flyers on every single car. That's where we start. Where do we end? I don't know. I don't think we do end, but I think we press and press and press for the sake of the gospel. Our regular prayer in our, men time, our men's prayer time on Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. in the conference room, men, if you want to join us. It's a great time of prayer. Our regular prayer is, God, we pray for an awakening at Manatee High School, that the gospel would, would become real. We pray for the teachers who are there who are believers, for the students who are there who are believers, but we pray for there to be a great awakening such that people go, what in the world is going on? But by the grace of God. Amen.